As we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Gracious God, by your spirit, open our minds to the recreating power of your word, that we may see the world through the mind of Christ and live in the world as a new creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The last portion of the book of Psalms contains poetry of praise and thanksgiving to God. This particular psalm also speaks of the tension between suffering when faith is tested and God's redemptive grace that leads to new life. God's steadfast love endures forever is a phrase used in the psalms, reminding us that we may at times turn away, but God is always there for us. Psalm 107, 1 through 3, 17 through 22. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. The book of Numbers in the 21st chapter tells the backstory for today's gospel lesson. We know the story of Moses speaking to Pharaoh in Egypt and leading the people out into the wilderness. It's a theme in the Hebrew scriptures, God's faithfulness to the people and the people's short memories of what God has done for them. This passage that we are going to hear is a more obscure part of the wilderness wanderings, and probably because it is difficult, it's not generally one that we would have learned in Sunday school. So listen to the word of God as it comes to us from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Horeb they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit, bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Then in our gospel passage for today, Jesus begins by referencing this passage from the book of Numbers. The lectionary has us begin in the middle of a conversation that Jesus was having with a religious leader. The first verse of the chapter set the context for the passage. It says, Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. I think we're intended to notice 
that Nicodemus came at night to talk with Jesus, that is not when you usually schedule a theological discussion. Presumably, Nicodemus did not want others to know that he was there until he decided what he believed about Jesus and his message. So now, our passage from John's Gospel, chapter 3. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it might be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The other morning as I was sitting down to begin work on the sermon, I became aware of a cardinal that was singing and singing outside my steady window. It's a sure sign every March in Minnesota when we hear cardinals singing, winter is ending, spring is almost here. The other sign that winter is waning are the increasing daylight hours. I know I'm not alone in relishing those longer hours of daylight. I remember a, friend's, a friend once told me she feels solar powered she has so much more energy on a sunny day. I agree, my countenance is positively brighter when the sun is shining. Daylight savings time that we began this weekend plays a bit with those daylight hours. I've read that Benjamin Franklin had the idea of moving the times with the seasons but was unable to get it instituted in this country. During World War I, daylight savings time was adapted in England. After the war, some in the US wanted to join England in observing it, but Woodrow Wilson's administration vetoed it. It was not until 1966 that it became a practice in this country to spring ahead in the spring, except in Hawaii and Arizona, although the Navajo Nation observes it, or as I discovered last spring, if you live in an Amish community in southern Minnesota. Light is a powerful image for us humans. Think of how we use light in our language. When we come to understand something, we say we see the light. Being enlightened is a good thing. No one wants a nightmare. Daydreams, however, can lead to creativity. I mention all of this because John's Gospel often speaks of light as representing belief. Turn ahead a few chapters in the gospel and we hear Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
Nicodemus had come to see Jesus under the cover of darkness. That did not go unnoticed by Jesus, who tells Nicodemus that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light. Jesus referenced that time when the people forgot all that God had done for them. It's not the first time that the people of Israel had forgotten God's faithfulness. It was a reoccurring theme among the people wandering in the wilderness. A section of the Bible could be titled, God Provides and the People Forget. When the people complained they did not have enough water, Moses struck a rock and water appeared. When they feared that they would starve, God sent manna each day, no more, no less, providing exactly what they needed. When, when they complained that they didn't like being vegetarians, God sent quail to eat. God provided again and again. But again and again, the people complained and wondered where God was. God sent those wandering people so many clues that there was nothing to fear. But it was like the people couldn't see God was right there in front of them, whatever they faced. Fears always overwhelmed them, and they lashed out at God. In a twist of divine irony, God uses an image of their fear, the serpent, for their healing. The Bible is filled with symbolism to help us understand God. The word translated in the Bible as poisonous serpent is in Hebrew seraphim. Sound familiar? Seraphim appear in other places in the Bible, not as a snake crawling on the ground, but working in the temple as a winged creature. God was showing the people a way out of the shadows into the light. Bring something into the light and it loses power. We call it implosion. When you face your fears directly, in order to minimize their power over you. Refusing to face one's fears can be immobilizing. Nicodemus would have known the story about the Israelites and the serpent, the story of the exodus and the entire wilderness wanderings were and still are central to the Jewish faith. Nicodemus would have experienced Jesus' words through the lenses of Moses' story. Nicodemus would have imagined the lifting up as a reference to healing. Jesus was speaking of the cross, but that would not be understood until the light had dawned on the day of resurrection. Embedded in this passage is the probably the most famous verse in the Bible, at least for those of us who have somehow known it all our lives. For many Christians, John 3.16 is the defining word of scripture. Martin Luther called it the gospel in a nutshell. I suspect pe many people who know nothing else of the Bible know that verse or at least know the reference, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Stop right there and consider what it tells us about God. At the center of the verse is love, God's unconditional love, love that will never let us go, love that, as the psalmist says, endures forever. God loves the world, all of us. Think of that the next time someone challenges your patience. God loves that person. Think of that the next time someone cuts you off in traffic. God loves that person. 
Think of that the next time you get angry with someone who acts unjustly or whose words are perverse. God loves that person and knows what is behind the words that they used or the way that they acted. I read an article in Christian Century that told that Martin Luther King Jr.'s first sermon at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church was on John 3:16. God's love has breadth, said Reverend King. It's a big love, it's a broad love. God's love is too big to be limited to a particular race. It's too great to be encompassed by a single nation. God is a universal God. We have just lived through a year where there's been so much to be fearful of. Start with a worldwide pandemic and go on down the list. This past year, if we learned anything, it surely has been that the earth is one. No nation, no race, no creed, none have been spared from this terrible time as the pandemic has infected the entire of our common humanity. It's sobering how exceptionally fast the virus spread and how quickly our numbers in the U.S skyrocketed ahead of other countries. It has been a year unlike any other, and we have all faced all kinds of fears needing to work together. We've learned much this past year how unrelenting this virus is alongside what we can do to protect ourselves and to stop its spread. And if we didn't know before, we have seen inequality in the healthcare across our country. So at last, we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. People are getting vaccinations. Discussions are beginning about how and when we can return to some semblance of life as we knew it a year ago. But there's work to do. We still need to address those disparities at a nation and the disparities in vaccine availability around the world. We need to continually remind ourselves that God loves us all. What would it be like to trust that God will care for us through all the uncertainties that we face? What would it be like if we were able to see each other as children of God and take into our hearts how God loves each one of us? How different the world would be if we treated everyone we meet as if they are a beloved child of God. For those of you who joined us in worship last week, I invited you to work on something, to watch for God at work in the world around you, and to find ways to share that love of God with someone else. Thank you to those of you who reported back to me on how that spiritual exercise went for you. Took a bit of resourcefulness when you haven't even met me to do that. I would still welcome hearing from you. And now I would add another spiritual discipline to try loving one another as God has loved you. Jesus our Lord reminded us it's easy to care for those that we love, so focus on those who are hard to love. Try praying especially for anyone with whom you are estranged Pray for those who have wounded you in the past. I believe that our own lives move into greater light when we are caught up in the dawning light of the love of God. This is the deepest of all blessings, the blessing of forgiveness, the blessing of peace, the blessing of wholeness of heart, the true blessing 
which is both our inheritance and our promise. May these blessings be with us as we seek to follow in the way of Jesus the Christ. Amen.